afternoon, everyone. I'm going to let everyone kind of filter in here for a minute or two, and then we will get started. All right. I think we have everyone. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, for our spring 2022 authors at Alden uh, with Dr. Laura Antwajira. She um, has a lot of information to share with us today. So I'm very quickly going to, I am Jen Harvey. I'm the library's uh, events coordinator. I'm very quickly going to share um, our housekeeping slide and then I will turn it over to Beth Pratt for introductions and then Laura Ann and Erba Dawson Ando for our discussion. We will have time at the end for audience questions. So we look forward to hearing what you all have to say. So bear with me one moment while I share my screen. Okay, so we have, for those of you who are maybe not as familiar with Teams, um, there are some features uh, that I'd like to point out to you. Um, if you could please keep your microphones muted until you're, you're called on. Um, we will offer the opportunity to raise your hand to ask your question. Um, you can use the, the three dots to find our chat feature. That's also where you will find um, the option to raise your hand. And if you would like to turn on live captioning, that is where you will find that as well. So the, the different colored arrows on this slide will kind of direct you there. So I hope that was brief enough. And if you have any questions during the presentation at all, please feel free to, to message me individually and I will do my best to help you out. So. Uh, now I'm going to turn it over to Beth Pratt, who is the director of the Ohio University Press, and she will be introducing our speakers today. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Um, yes, I'm Beth Pratt, and uh, as director of OU Press, it is a special pleasure to welcome Laura Ann Twajira to Authors at Alden. OU Press publishes about 35 books a year, and we have a strong reputation in publishing books in African studies. Laura Ann's book is a recent release in our award-winning New African Studies series. Uh, Laura Ann Twajira is an associate professor in the history department at Wesleyan University, where she also chairs the African Studies program. In addition, she is an affiliated faculty member of Wes Wesleyan's Science and Society Program and Feminist Gender and Sexuality Studies. Her work has been recognized by the International Committee for the History of Technology and the American Historical Society. While completing her recent book, which she's going to speak about today, Embodied Engineering, Gendered Labor, Food Security and Taste in 20th Century Mali, she was supported as a scholar in residence at the Schoenberg Center for Research and as a fellow at the Wesleyan Center for the Humanities. Research for the book was also supported by a Fulbright Hayes Research Fellowship, the International Committee for the History of, History of Technology, the Society for the History of Technology, and Wesleyan University. In addition to the book, Professor Twajira recently edited the special issue of Africanizing Technology for the journal Technology and Culture, which appeared in 2020. She has also published in the journal Gender and History and has written for the public history of technology site Technologies Stories. Her current research centers on the technobody politics of the colonial encounter in Mali with a focus on vernacular understandings of public health and population, early vaccination programs, the census, and baby weighing. She will be um, interviewed and speaking today with our, our very own Araba Dawson Ando. Um, Araba is a subject librarian for African Studies and the Social Sciences at Ohio University Libraries. She received her MLIS from the University of Pittsburgh School of Computing and Information, and she authors the Africa section of Magazines for Libraries and has published journal articles and presented at various African studies and library conferences. 
Ereba is also a member of Ohio University Press Advisory Board, for which we are eternally grateful. She also serves on the executive committee of CRL Camp as past chair and is the editor, African History, Literature and Languages section of the ACRL Choice Researches Resources for College Libraries. So welcome, Laura Ann and Ereba. I think that I'm sharing. Someone let me know if I'm, if it's not. <laughs> we can see it, Laura Ann. Oh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> I'm also new to Teams. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be with you all uh, today to talk about my book, Embodied Engineering. I'm just going to say a few things before I'll take questions uh, from from uh, from Araba. Uh, but the book uh, that uh, that I wrote is really about women as technological agents in West Africa and more specifically in Mali. Uh, the women's engineering work that I talk about, that's why it's, uh, it's in the title there, uh, but that engineering work talk uh, relates to food production in a region that is predominantly rural and has faced significant ecological crises at different moments in the 20th century and which have thus prompted specific technological interventions by women to ensure daily meals. Those technological interventions were also specifically embodied. Broadly speaking, that meant women's physical labor and new techniques, but also the transformation of women's bodies in many cases. This entailed uh, physical labor and techniques for pounding millet or stirring the pot, for example, but it also included innovations such as the wrapping of cloth so as to hide bundles of threshed rice under a woman's clothing during what was a period of militarized control over the harvest in the 1970s. So there's a range of technological uh, acts and innovations in engineering um, that I'm looking at. The technique with the cloth um, in particular often transformed the appearance of a woman's body to appear pregnant when she attached the bundle uh, to her stomach uh, in the front. And one of my interviewees who told me about the technique uh, said that when she carried rice uh, in this way to the market and then retrieved the bundle, it was like you gave birth. Uh, and so for this reason and others, um, I call the bundles of rice harvested by women in this manner, uh, rice uh, babies. This is just to give you a taste of some of the things uh, from the book. Women's embodied engineering changed over the course of the 20th century and also responded to specific ecological concerns, such as the need to conserve labor and wood fuel during the early period, uh, the earlier period of the 1940s. In this case, women adopted new metal pots in the place of clay ones because they cooked faster and they actually required less wood to do all of that work. So this major technological shift actually could have occurred much earlier because metalworking in the region was very well developed in prior centuries. But women drove this shift in the 1940s to respond to a particular colonial deforestation crisis. So it's through these shifts and other innovations in women's labor that the vast majority of women in Mali engaged with and took a formative role in shaping the region's 20th century history from the colonial era under the French to its post-colonial uh, transformations. This labor that I talk about in the book involved food cultivation and preparation, but also the reshaping of landscapes, marketing and cash production, meaning that women were at the center of the region's political, economic, and environmental history, right, if you draw it all together. Uh, one other key takeaway uh, point from the book that I'd like to highlight is that I pushed back at a persistent image of rural women in Africa as subjects without access to or knowledge of technology. I do so with the aim of reorienting conversations about technology that too often frame the continent in need of technological aid rather than recognizing it as a space of technological knowledge production. These have been stubborn stereotypes um, and have obscured really to uh, serve to obscure women's creative work and innovation. So what I narrate in the book is this technologically dynamic women's world of food production in Mali. And I also present the domestic arena as one of creativity and innovation, even in moments of ecological or other crisis. 
As I was conducting uh, research for the book, um, I learned that much of this dyna dynamism was actually recorded in regional folk tales, and I would like to share a, a quick um, example. In one story, a woman asks her female neighbor to borrow a cooking pot. The neighbor obliges the request, and after a few days, the first woman returns the original pot along with the smaller one. The first woman, in giving her neighbor the two pots, calls the smaller one the daughter of the big pot. Not long after this episode in the story, the same woman returns again to borrow the big cooking pot, but this time she does not return it. When the neighbor inquires after her pot, she is told the pot is dead. The audience for the story is then prompted to ask, how is it the pot died? And the first woman in the story replies, since they have daughters. The big pot's transformation into a mother serves as a comic, albeit dark, explanation for the woman's failure to return the pot. When I first read this story, for me, it signaled the importance of the larger technological infrastructure managed by women, but also its potentially shifting nature. Cooking pots, like in the story, were central to this woman's infrastructure. And both women in the story negotiate their access to a number of different cooking pots, just as women throughout the 20th century innovated and managed transformations in the range of tools and technologies that were available to them for food preparation and production. This particular story also connects women and their means of cooking with physical labor, specifically the experience of childbirth. Food preparation is a similarly distinct woman's task associated with sexuality, social reproduction, environmental fertility, and women's embodied labors. So the naming of one of the pots a daughter also alludes to women's difficult and potentially dangerous labor, both in childbirth and food production. But it also highlights the complex relations between women who must work together. At first glance, it does seem to be a story of failed female co cooperation, but I think the humor suggests a more positive interpretation, that is, if women heed the lesson. Collective female labor was essential to ensuring food every day. And finally, one more thing on the story, the daughter pot suggests that there's a transmission of feminine knowledge and social continuity. So, you know, ultimately what women did with their pots matters a great deal. This story circulated in the first decades of the 20th century, but most of my book focuses on women's rural engineering at a major development scheme created by the French in the 1930s and is still in operation today. I'm gonna to share a map to orient us a little bit here. Um, from the beginning of this particular uh, development scheme, it was uh, characterized by large industrial machines and was meant to turn the region into a ca cotton cash crop center, but also a colonial bread basket. I'm gonna share another image with some slides to give you a sense of those technologies. Uh, the project itself and its large irrigation infrastructure have been much studied because the scheme was one of the most significant uh, development interventions by the French in West Africa. Not surprisingly, this top-down uh, colonial project brought about dramatic and unpredictable changes to rural life, much like other modernizations of the same modernization schemes of the same period. This particular scheme was called the Office du Niger after the Niger River that powered the irrigation. And for the first decades of its existence, farmers suffered waterborne illnesses, food shortages, and chronic malnutrition. Women were strikingly absent during these years. And it was when they did stay and their food production labor that they brought that made the space of the project livable. Essentially, they re-engineered their work so that they could do it at this particular project. I'm going to share one more set of images from the project to give you a sense of women at the project and what they were doing. Women's daily work uh, with technologies that were modest, like pots, was perhaps much less dramatic than the entry of digging machines, tractors, threshing machines that you saw on the previous slide, but their work significantly impacted the material experiences of daily life. And I'll just add uh, that women's work uh, was attuned to the taste of food rather than the focus of the office of Indonesia planners who were thinking more about production for, uh, uh, for export and perhaps mere subsistence. So over the course of the book, I tell the story of these rural women engineers who transformed 
the office de Niger by engineering and then re-engineering their food production systems and preparation techniques over several decades. And in so doing, they created delicious and meaningful food that people wanted to eat. And they helped to create an animated world in the face of real challenges, right? And some of the animation you see in the picture um, with the, the drummers on the slide here, it was an event at the Office de Niger where there was also food that had been produced by women and was being shared. And so this was a moment of um, sort of lively animation that women helped to uh, produce. Um, one other thing uh, that I'll just say before I turn it over to, to Arba is that uh, the visual and sensorial aspects of their labor, like the sound of the mortar and pestle, um, made playing the value of their labor to the people that they lived with, um, even if it wasn't always recognized by planners of this project. But their labor, sure, it was mundane and it's everyday necessity, but it was also spectacular and its significance for assuring food security and the very nature of rural life. So I'll leave it there, I'll unshare my screen and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, from Alba. Thank you, Laura. And uh, I really enjoyed reading the book, even though being from West Africa, I'm familiar with a lot of uh, what you were talking about, the pestle and the pots and all that. I still learned a lot from the contributions of African women to the both the economic and the technological aspects of African life. Yeah, so my first question is, you state in the introduction that women's mundane yet extraordinary daily food production and preparation labors over the course of the 20th century are the subject of this book. How did you develop an interest in this topic and why women in Mali? Thanks for that question. Um, so the, the, the idea for the book, uh, I really was developing as a graduate student, at, as a doctoral student at Rutgers University, where I studied African history and women's and gender history from a global uh, perspective. But I was really drawing on um, early experiences that I had when I was placed as a Peace Corps volunteer in Mali. That was really my first experience to meet women and actually learn from them. So while I was there, um, I had the experience of seeing firsthand and learning how women produced food, how they worked with different technologies, um, how sometimes they collectively work together. So it sparked a lot of, of questions for me that I wanted to learn a little bit more about um, that the way that they were able to conserve specific uh, resources uh, was certainly impressive to me as a young uh, American student who had just finished uh, undergraduate and was, was going into the Peace Corps. I was also impressed by their sort of collective labor organizing. So it sparked a lot of questions in for me and I realized, wow, there's a lot to learn here. Uh, and then when I was back in Mali doing my field work, um, talking more with women, um, you know, many of whom have become my friends, that I realized, wow, this is a history of technology and I hadn't realized it. So it developed over a long period of time, but it was really important for me to listen to women, observe them and really kind of learn without any kind of preconception and to see actually what is the history before me. And I think that's how I was able to figure out, wow, this is a history that spread so widely in terms of economic, political, social, and technological history that um, that I was really only able to get because of my, you know, the conversations that I that I had uh, with them. So that's sort of the the origin of the of the project. Why do you describe the woman in your study as engineers? Thanks. Okay, that's another fantastic question, and it was one that I kind of wasn't sure if I wanted to use, um, but. Um, in the history of technology, engineers are often referred to as the, like the men, like the ones who developed the technologies and the infrastructure of this project, the Orpheus du Niger, and not often used to talk about women. But when I was thinking about the way that they put together an infrastructure, managed different kinds of technologies, and adapted it over time, I realized what they're doing is engineering work. But if we're not calling them engineers, we're not recognizing the intellectual labor that goes into producing a food production system and the skills that are necessary for understanding these technologies and using them. So it's only by really sort of recognizing that that we can see the creativity and innovation of, of women's work. So it's not just recognizing their technological work, but also elevating them so that we understand in the history of technology, 
that women are also engineers and that we can study them to the same same level that we might study um, some engineers at the office being year. And in many ways, they actually made it work better. <laughs> So they were perhaps the better engineers at the, the office in each year. Of course, if I'm in Mali, there are conversations to be had about different folks who are in charge of some of those roles now. But really, the thinking about women as engineers, for me, sort of shifted everything. That's really how we can see that they are agents of technological history and are really sort of driving things and are intellectually and creatively thinking about um, how to use different, different technologies, how to shift them, because over time, not only were they using um, uh, pots and mortars and pestles, technologies that they already had you know, um, experience using, but when they came to this particular project, there were big canals cut out for irrigation for the fields. And women decided, oh, these are like rivers, we're gonna start using them like a, a water resource. So they started using the technologies of the project in a way that benefited their own work. They also did this by working alongside uh, threshing machines so that the sort of large scale and, and modest technologies in their world, they brought together in a very productive way that the planners hadn't thought of. So to my mind, they're really the engineers of the office manager. <laughs> you described the skills uh, of the women residents of the office in detail, their participation in economic activities, such as the food and cotton production system mm -hmm. and adopting labor saving technologies. However, the economic contributions of African women are often overlooked by policymakers. To what extent did colonial policies contribute to this marginalization? Right, uh, that's another really excellent question. Um, colonial officials, um, not just those at the Office du Niger, tended to think about what they were doing, what they called development, as targeting men. And they were really the ones that they sort of had in mind thinking about developing colonial markets, uh, for example, and didn't think that women really were participating in those markets or that they should be. At the same time, the markets around the Office du Niger were buzzing with the activity of women who were selling different foodstuffs, um, some of which they had manufactured, and were really um, helping that local economy to run for people to have access to different foodstuffs that they needed. That's, this was sort of run by women. Um, so they really were important economic actors, but you're right, it's not always necessarily recognized. So the same with women as technological actors, they need to be recognized for the work that they are actually doing uh, in the economy. Uh, some of the women that I interviewed when we were talking about this kind of work, when they were doing, when they were selling or buying or doing things, they call it farming uh, for for cash or farming for money, uh, because this was also something that they understood was work that they sort of produced, right? That they were able to sort of produce cash in the economy, but it was also essential for them to have the money that they needed to buy foodstuffs that maybe they weren't able to produce themselves, because the specific layout of the office. Um, meant that the trees or um, other foodstuffs that they might ordinarily have access to changed when the landscape changed. So they had to figure out where they could get it from other women who were producing it. So they figured out how to create an economic infrastructure essentially to get the things uh, that they needed and sold things that other women needed. So in this way, um, women were really doing a lot of economic work, but the colonial officials didn't necessarily recognize that. And that was a pattern that's continued that I think still sorts of um, continues that what women are actually doing doesn't always show up in reports related to um, national economy numbers and statistics. But if we actually look at what women are doing, it helps us to shift how we might think about economics and policies and recognize the work that women are, are actually doing. I hope that answers the question. I went off on a bit of a tangent, but I think I brought it back to where you were going. <laughs> yeah, and uh, the next question is, uh, some of the practices at the office, such as rewarding women's work with rice and then men's work with um, paid wages, mm -hmm. could be described as discrimination against women. How did this practice impact gender relations in Mali? Yeah, that's another fantastic question for thinking about women in the economy. So women um, prior to the arrival of the office in the French in this region would sometimes help a neighbor get in the harvest, right? That it often required collective women's labor and it was customary for women to be rewarded with some of the harvest, rice or something else. Um, and this was one way that colonial officials thought, okay, we're, we're gonna encourage uh, local customs, we're respecting custom. 
But at the same time, they weren't doing that for men. They were giving men wage jobs, wage jobs, waged jobs. They were expecting men to participate in the cash economy, in part because colonial officials wanted men to pay taxes in cash for the colonial government. So they really wanted men in the cash economy. Um, and at the same time, they, they weren't thinking about women in the cash economy. Uh, and they thought, okay, so we're, we're just going to replicate the practices before we'll give them remuneration and rice. Well, certainly that created um, divisions between men and women in the economy, right? Men had more opportunities to, to get cash. And this goes back to the, the previous question when I was talking about women who said we were going to farm money because they weren't able to get cash in many other ways. They figured out how to do it. One of the things that they often did was to make beer. They brew beer, sometimes even selling it to their husbands, um, but also workers at the office who had wages, unmarried men who were single. There were a lot of parties. This is part of the sort of rural animation that women helped to produce at the project. And women made money by selling beer at these uh, festivals. And so in that way, they still got access to uh, the office du Niger as a cash source, but it was through the wages of men who wanted to purchase uh, the beer uh, that they were producing. So they had to figure out other ways to continue to, you know, to participate in this changing economy that increasingly was focused on cash. When it's true, they were definitely disadvantaged by colonial policies, the way that colonial officials understood women in the market. So it goes back to the question that you had earlier that there are these imbalances that have continued as a sort of pattern and women are continuing to try to negotiate uh, against that. Um, and those are some of the ways that they they, they tried to do that within the, the space of what was possible at the office. Thanks. Yeah, being a librarian, I'm interested in some of the methods and sources you used in your research, including the different types of primary sources and some of the challenges you encountered. Yeah, that's uh, another fantastic question. Every project requires its own sort of set of resources, right? Um, as a historian, um, when I started working on this project, it became obvious to me um, pretty quickly that this was not going to be one that I could only do through archival research. Uh, so of course, I um, conducted research in um, the archives for this for the development project itself. Other archives in Mali related to colonial officials. Um, uh, there are also archives um, left by colonial officials in Paris, but I went to Rome to look at materials that missionaries who were based at this, at, they had a mission station um, at this scheme, and I looked at some of their material. They more often wrote about men and women and their social lives because they were thinking about how to connect them to the church, and that was one of the ways that they, they thought about doing that. But most of these documents didn't really talk about women very much, so I had to do a lot of oral history interviews. So a lot of the time when I was in Mali doing research, I was talking to men and women in different towns across the project about this history from over the course of the, the 20th century. And there are different generations who spoke in particular about the 1940s or who could speak really to the period of the 1970s. So I had to collect uh, an archive essentially um, about the Office du Niger. And in many cases, researchers who had come to talk to, to study this project, there are quite a few who have been interested not very many have even in, been thinking about talking to women. Um, and so some of the uh, the challenge I faced is that um, uh, people were already aware of researchers and a bias that the, the project was about men. And so it took some convincing to s explain why I wanted to talk to women. Um, but and then once you do that, you still have to, you know, gain the trust of people. You have to get to know them. They have to get to know you because if they're going to do an interview with you, they're giving up their time. They're talking about their own lives, um, and that's you know that's a big ask for people. So they have to feel like that they trust their story with you, and that what you're going to do with it, in some way, is you know elaborating their story and allowing them to tell it to an audience that is, is going to be be listening. On top of the interviews, which are a really big base of my my resource of, of my archival and of my of my research, I also um, looked at folk tales like the one that I talked about. For thinking about the early decades for uh, for which there aren't that many people who have direct memories of that time period um, but i also wanted to come from a frame of local perspective how do people understand their relationship to the environment their relations between men and women how they understood technology and i was surprised to discover there are a lot of stories about pots <laughs> pleasantly surprised so that enabled me to also think about the perspective of um, people on the ground from that time period and how they were thinking about these things. Uh, so those were sort of, you know, some 
uh, a mix of things in addition to that participant observation, um, learning how what, what does the technique look like when women are cooking or taking care of their pots was also something that I had to do. So I had to draw all of these sort of sources together. So that was certainly a challenge getting to the, the different the different archives, but it made it a really dynamic research experience and the interviews were social and extremely enjoyable to get to know people and that um, for a historian is really wonderful to do, especially for you know coming out of the archive to get to talk to people and to have a sort of really lively exchange for thinking about uh, about the past is is wonderful. Yeah, as you've uh, illustrated, there are challenges in documenting African women's history, even though it, it's part of African history, mm -hmm. so it's important. Um, what advice do you have for students and future researchers of women in Africa? That's fantastic. On how to successfully yeah. conduct their research. Yeah. Um, you know, especially for the students who are who are at your institution, there are lots of resources, right? To make um, to make use of them where you can study the, the the language of the place that you're interested in and use the resources to learn about as much about it as possible uh, before you go. Um, but I think the language training is is so important, especially if you're thinking about doing oral history, because that allows you uh, to think from frameworks and how language is used and how people speak. It allows you to access folk st folk stories. Some of the ones that I looked at. Uh, there's a French translation, but I could also read the original because they had been collected um, by an African interpreter, and he wrote down in a you know transcription um, of his his writing. Uh, the the way Bamana is written now is a bit different, but you can still read it and see the original and think about it and how it's been translated. So those language skills are really important. Uh, and then also to be able to sort of interview people, you might still work with someone um, who uh, helps you access different places locally. But to be able to speak and understand um, the place where you're working is so imperative. Um, then, you know, of course, in addition to that, um, reading, you know, everything in classes, but learn about the place where you think you want to go. Um, newspapers, magazines, what are people publishing now? What are people talking about? I think that's the sort of best preparation to learn about a place and then figure out what my what might my question be before you get out uh, into the field. That's in my mind, the, the best way to, to do that training and at Ohio, they're certainly lucky to have all kinds of resources to help them get prepared to do that. Thanks. Your book brings together African gender history with the field of science and technology studies. What other emerging trends do you currently see regarding women and gender studies in Africa? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's an exciting moment for women's and gender scholars. Uh, Naminata Jabate just won the big book prize from the African Studies Association. It's um, a, a book that focuses on um, women's practices in particular in, in relationship to sexuality and protest. Um, and there are other scholars working on just thinking about gender from African perspectives, thinking about sexuality. There's many, um, lots of books coming out on that. There's new associations being formed uh, related to those kinds of questions. Um, there are lots of books coming out that really are thinking about creative expressions, uh, writers, artists, that I think are, are really exciting, focusing on women's creative expression, as well as uh, women as political actors and new ways to think about um, social life of women. There's a fantastic book that came out on love in Africa. These were topics that weren't necessarily discussed before, but they give sort of a fuller picture of different women's African, uh, different women, African women's lives so that um, there's multiple narratives, right? To think about it as a dynamic and creative space and how women's lives have changed over time. There are more textbooks now that um, like one from Wanda Achebe that thinks about women's history from the early period to the present. They're giving us a lot more tools for writing more uh, histories to just add more. And I think that's what's really exciting in the field right now, that there's also an audience for that. More people are interested in reading from lots of different perspectives. And I think that's um, making for a really great um, place to be as a researcher right now because it's so dynamic and there's so many great people to, to talk to and think about um, different ideas with more. Res and there's also more research resources for teachers um, than before, which is fantastic <laughs> as well. And also it's good for us librarians as collection development for collection development gives us ideas on how to look for new materials on uh, African studies. Yeah, so that so it was for my own interest. That's why I asked the question. <laughs> OK, 
Yeah, your study spans the livelihoods of rural Malian women from the early colonial administrations through the post-colonial administrations. Uh, can you briefly, uh, briefly describe any significant changes in the women's livelihoods mm -hmm. throughout those uh, that yeah. period? Yeah, no, that's another really good question, right? Um, because it might seem at first that women were doing a lot of the same things in terms of uh, food preparation and, and cultivation, but actually the strategies for turning that labor into a cash making sort of initiative has changed in, in different ways. Uh, women's cooperatives often now um, are means by which women are seeking uh, to, to earn cash uh, at, the, at the office du Niger in particular through market gardening, so carving out spaces of the of the project uh, to grow onions, uh, sometimes fruit trees, other things that weren't necessarily in the purview of the scheme before, but now women are cultivating those items and selling them to markets like the big urban market. And Bamako is one of the, the big markets that women are selling to. Um, so the way that they're, uh, they're organizing collectively is being turned into a way for women to also think about how there, there might be some cash incentives for them uh, and working together. I think that is uh, one of the big shifts. Women, there's been different forms of collective work uh, for women and um, it's changed over time, but I think that was one change that I noticed because women were talking to me about it, that this is something that they thought was a significant uh, change uh, for themselves in, in particular. So even though women might be continuing, they're, they're cultivating, they're preparing food, um, that's a major shift for them in their own minds that that's giving them access to more economic opportunity than they would have had in sort of the earlier decades that there's more opportunities now for for earning cash and then it's augmented when they when they're working together so i think that was that's a significant one of course uh for for livelihoods at the, the office um that also has to do with um challenges that women uh face in owning machines there's a major change at this project where individual threshing machines were purchased by, by men in a period of market liberalization, and men predominated in that purchasing. So there's a few women who bought rice threshing machines, and all of the women know who they are and aspire to, to be able to do something like that, but without um, the, the capital to purchase, they've worked together. And so there are some cooperatives that now have grain grinding machines, for example. Uh, so they're um, they're using the, the collective labor to, to access um, technologies that uh, that allow you to, to to create more cash because you're you're charging for the service to use the machine and they're seeking access to that. So they're using the collective labor to allow them to do that. Thanks. Um, the last but not the least question is um, your book recognizes food production, cooking and taste as important aspects of Malian culture. Do you have a favorite Malian food? <laughs> <laughs> of course, I have many favorite Malian foods. <laughs> yeah, since you visited <laughs> there and you, you went there on Peace Corps. The the, yeah, the one that I perhaps miss the most that's harder to get, there are West African uh, restaurants if you go to New York City and Harlem, which I love very much, but it's hard to get this dish called toe. So it's made from millet uh, and it's, as it's cooked, it's, it's like a, a sort of moist, cake, but it's not sweet at all. Uh, so you grab some of it and you dip it in a wonderful sauce that's made with spices, different um, uh, leaves, and there's a separate sauce. There's, it's, it's, it's intricate because there's one sauce that has all of um, the, the sort of spices and vegetable ingredients, and then there's another really savory, wonderful sauce with meat, and you dip it in both. And then when you, so when you put it all together, it's just wonderful and delicious. And I talk about this um, in the book quite a bit because women are very intent on making good toe. Sometimes we had to change it to rice toe. Now it's definitely a back to, to making it with millet. And that's, there's a, the flavor of that I miss. Um, another one that I really like is made with fonio, which is um, a wild grass uh, that used to be much more prevalent in the diet but has become something of a delicacy now. It's like a small grain that when you cook it, it might look a little bit like couscous. And there's a particular delicious sauce uh, that goes with that, that I, that I really like. And I like buying food in markets that women are preparing. There's a really yummy uh, sort of fried, kind of um, salty and tangy um, fried bit that you can get that's made, you can get things that are infused with peanuts and millet and all kinds of different tasty treats in the market. And I always uh, and enjoy uh, that as well, in addition to the, you know, the, the, the full meals uh, that you can make. 
Um, and I miss breakfast dishes as well. I miss sari. It's kind of like a porridge um, that is also uh, quite delicious. So the, the cuisine, I hope I conveyed in the book, is something that not only that I hear people talking about being tasty, but I recognize <laughs> very much that it is just simply delicious. <laughs> yeah, the tour to me, it's something like a, it's like a hardened uh, porridge, isn't it? Yes. That's it's, something yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I think that's, yeah. And I don't know, what is the right way to describe the consistency of this wonderful <laughs> Uh, starchy food that uh, that we don't necessarily have in the United States, and I haven't. Um, the, you know, the only way you can get it is uh, to to get the millet and know, know a, a Malian cook, or to know how to make it yourself. <laughs> but then you don't even have all of the good uh, tree ingredients and spices that you need. So maybe in Harlem, one could make it. <laughs> But maybe there's some other places in the U.S. But that's the, the those are the foods I miss the most. Okay, okay, thanks, Laura. I, that, these are all my questions, and uh, I'll turn it back to Jen to for the audience questions. Okay, yes, thank you. Thank you both so very much, and thank you for those wonderful descriptions. Because I I know I'm hungry now, and I'm sure a few <laughs> other people are too. <laughs> so we're we're gonna open it up for questions uh, from our audience at this point. We've got a couple options. You can either um, Type your type your question in the chat or raise your hand and I'll call on you and you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, we do have a comment that says uh, from Sherry Sains, the closest thing to toe is Southern spoon bread. Oh, so I'm making I'm making a note as I speak. <laughs> And while our audience is, is thinking of their questions, I am going to drop a link in the chat to the Ohio University Press page for your book so that if anyone wants to order it, mm -hmm. that is where they will find it. And they can find more information there. Um, yeah, so I guess we'll we'll hang out and wait for a few minutes and see if we have any questions. While we wait, I just want to um, thank you for um, your close reading of the book and the really uh, thoughtful questions that I appreciated uh, thinking about <laughs> as, as we talked about earlier that I always I like to emphasize technology, but you're right, pulling out the, the important pieces of economic history for women uh, and how it's connected to technology uh, is, is, is important to, to think about. Um, beyond just even the, the the space of the of the book in this particular part of um, of, of West Africa, but it, as applicable as you were suggesting to the, the wider region and women in the wider wider region. I learned you, a, I learned a lot from it actually <laughs> that I didn't know about. I didn't even know that Mali used to be um, French Sudan. Honestly, <laughs> yeah, I didn't know. <laughs> Yeah, well, I made a choice that it, the, the title of the book, even though a bunch of the period that I cover is from that colonial period when it was referred to as French Sudan, but I think it's important to refer to it as, as Mali. That's the, you know, the, and that's the, the, the post colonial period, how it's referred, but it also references a post colonial empire uh, that spans part of the, the geography of the region. And so, um, you know, I thought it was important to, to use the, the term Mali uh, in, in the book. Do you have any plans, Dr. Trujillo, to return to Mali anytime soon, either for further research or just to visit your friends? Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm working on a trip to take some books <laughs> <laughs> um, that, you know, hopefully it will overlap with, with some research, but there are quite a few people who I'm bringing books to, um, including uh, the archivist, of, uh, who is a woman at the Office du Niger, um, the, the woman uh, who was the archivist when I was there the last time. I want to make sure that she gets a book. Um, but also the, the the National Archives, and there's a fantastic uh, women's library that's named after um, uh, a really important Awakita. She was a, she's an important figure uh, uh, for uh, she was an anti-colonial activist. She was a, a government minister, and there's a women's library and research center named after her. And so I'm thinking of taking a, a book. I want to take a book uh, there to them uh, as well. Uh, so that's that's the hope and my new project that I'm working on. I've done some archival research for, but I have to do the oral uh, the oral history. So I need to do some initial steps uh, for that. So I'm hoping to go soon. Uh, <laughs> um, now that the book is out, I want to go with books uh, in my suitcase. <laughs> that's wonderful. I hope I hope you get to go very very soon because it sounds like you have a, a a great affection for the women. Oh, I mean, and I, the communities there. Individual <laughs> relationships with people that need. <laughs> 
uh, the, the world to me. Uh, you know, the, the woman who's on the cover, Hassan, um, is someone who I really grew uh, to, to know and to like very well over the, the time of, of the project. Um, and actually, so um, so that's a picture that I took. Um, and uh, when I took it, I told her this is going to be the cover of my book and I want to show her <laughs> that it is. <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, I'm I'm not seeing any questions from our audience. I think I think maybe everybody, your questions were so comprehensive that that we've covered everything. Could that be? Um, <laughs> but I, I want to thank you both so much for your time this afternoon. Um, I am going to drop another link in the chat um, that's to a very brief uh, survey. If everyone in the audience would take a moment to please complete that, I would greatly appreciate it. Um, and Thank you all very, very much. I appreciate you coming. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, yeah, thanks Laura, for Thank your you again answers. for those questions. Looking forward to seeing you at the next conference. <laughs> <laughs>